Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, Roscosmos announced the crew for two Soyuz missions which will carry tourists to the International Space Station in October and December. Now, if we add that into Inspiration4, which will fly in September, Axiom's AX-1 flight, which could be as early as January 2022, and a possible future flight by Tom Cruise to shoot a movie, this means there's going to be a lot more tourists in space than ever before. And actually, before that, we are expecting the first flight of New Shepard with an actual paying passenger after Blue Origin announced an auction for the very first seat alongside five Blue Origin employees. There's no firm date for this, but it could be as early as July. So I'm actually kind of surprised that in the world of space tourism, suborbital tourist flights never managed to get going in great numbers before, well now. Virgin Galactic got going long before SpaceX began developing Crew Dragon, but it's been cursed by all sorts of problems, including a crash which killed uh, one of their pilots and destroyed their spacecraft. They've carried one passenger to space who was a trait, you know, worked with a company. And then after that, they moved their base from California to Spaceport New Mexico and pretty much stopped flying for two years. Blue Origin, meanwhile, they've had lots of successful tests of New Shepard. They've generated lots of flight data. They've shown that the vehicle is safe and reliable and definitely okay to put humans on. New Shepard are actually arguably provides a superior experience in many ways with much larger windows and a bit more room to move around. Although you can't look straight down uh, as you can in Spaceship 2 because it flips on its back uh, during Apogee so you can actually see the Earth laid out below you. So yeah, I mean, these suborbital flights are hundreds of thousands of dollars for a few minutes of weightlessness and a wonderful view from above the Carmen line. But you know, if you just want zero G, by the way, you can actually pay for parabolic flights uh, and those only cost a few thousand dollars for, you know, uh, many short hops of 30 seconds or more. But anyway, for the orbital flights, uh, in the next 12 months, we can expect to have a number of flights. We're going to start with Inspiration4 in September. And this is going to be a free flying Dragon flight, which won't go to the International Space Station. And that meant that it avoided scheduling problems with the station's very limited docking adapters. The crew of four will spend three days in orbit. Uh, they'll be actually at a higher altitude than the International Space Station, but because they're inside a single Dragon capsule, they won't have much room to move around and do backflips and stuff like that, but they will have fantastic views, better views than you would get from the Space Station, arguably. Now, since it's not docking to the International Space Station, the docking system at the front will be replaced with a transparent dome to allow the passengers to stick their head in and experience really wide-angle vistas of the Earth in space. Uh, the Dragon spacecraft that they're going to use, by the way, is Resilience. That's the spacecraft that was used by Crew-1, which just returned to Earth after their six-month flight to the ISS. So the crew for Inspiration4 are Jared Isaacman, who's a pilot and a businessman, and he's footing the bill for the whole thing. There's Haley Arsenault, who's a phys physician with uh, St. Jude. There's Dr. Cyan Proctor, a science communicator on YouTube and everything. And Christopher Sombrowski, who he's been a space fan for a long time. And he more or less won a lottery ticket to get on his flight. Technically, someone he knew won the lottery ticket and gave it to him. And I, I want friends like that. But honestly, for Inspiration4 is probably my favorite one of the missions because it's just doing something very different with a lot of cool people. Uh, so next up, there's going to be Soyuz MS-19, and that's in October. And that's going to have movie director Klim Shipenko and an actress, Yulia Perselid, who sh they're going to stay on the ISS for a week to shoot scenes for a movie which is titled The Challenge. Now, Klim Shipenko was the director of Salyut 7, and that's a movie that tells the story of the rescue and repair of the Salyut 7 space station in the 1980s. And it's not a particularly accurate movie. It's got lots of extra events tagged on, but it's cool that somebody wanted to make a movie about Salyut 7, right? Apparently, there are a few other actresses in reserve if any problems turn up during training over the next few months. But, uh, you know, that's what's expected to happen in October. And so they'll be working by then in the newly expanded Russian segment of the space station. They'll have Nalka planned for delivery in July and the pre-shell docking module will arrive in September. 
And these people were only staying for a few days and they will actually return. They'll go up on MS-19 and return on MS-18. What they're doing is essentially delivering a fresh Soyuz to the crew in the ISS. The Soyuz needs to be replaced every six months because the hydrogen peroxide fuel for the descent module slowly decomposes over time. So next in December, we have Soyuz MS-20 and we have a familiar name and face, Yosaka Maezawa, the Japanese billionaire behind Dear Moon, one of the big investors in Starship development. He will be making his first space flight on a Soyuz. Alongside production assistant Yozo Hirano, who will document the flight, presumably posting all over the Instagram. And many of you might be wondering why Yusaka is not flying on a SpaceX rocket, given that he's given SpaceX a lot of money for Starship. And I think probably the main problem is that he wants to fly to the ISS. And that means there's very limited opportunities because NASA is controlling the number of flights, in part because they have very limited availability of docking slots. There's only two pressurized mating adapters that have to be shared between the crew and Cargo Dragon and Starliner, which incidentally looks like it's scheduled to finally fly and dock to the ISS in late July. So this, this Soyuz tourist flight in December is unlike the previous ones because the crew are taking the same spacecraft up and down instead of using a short mission as an opportunity to ferry up a replacement vehicle for a crew on the station. So this is the first time they've actually done a dedicated tourist flight up and down. Now, the first US tourist flight uh, to the ISS will be on Axiom's AX-1, and that will happen no earlier than January 2021. It's going to use a Dragon spacecraft, and this was actually pitched as the original, well, this was originally going to be the flight that took Tom Cruise and his director, who I think is Doug Lyman, to space, and uh, that project has apparently been pushed out a bit for unspecified reasons. It, it's still on, but we just don't know when. So the crew of AX-1 has veteran astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria as a commander. He's also the a VP of Axiom. And then on top of him, or next to him technically, sorry, there are three paying passengers. Larry Connor, real estate investor, entrepreneur, but he's, you know, he's cool. He's also a pilot, racer. He races cars off-road and stuff. He also went to the bottom of the ocean, the bottom of the Challenger deep in a submarine called the Limiting Factor. There's Eitan Stebe, who's an Israeli businessman and an investor. He also flew with the Israeli Air Force. And that included a stint as an F-16 pilot in a squadron commanded by Ilan Ramon, who was Israel's first astronaut, and he died in the Columbia disaster. Finally, there's Canadian Mark Pathy, who's a, yeah, he's an investor, businessman, and I'm sure he has some cool stories if you look up his background. But look, each of these people are there because they're investors that have made a lot of money and they like space, and they had to pay $55 million for the flight. And apparently there's been recent changes to pricing for ISS operations from NASA. And I think they now have to pay $10 million per person for the time that they're staying on the ISS to cover you know, consumables, to cons uh, cover astronaut time and things like that. So you know, Axiom is actually an interesting company for another reason, because they are also contracted to develop and deliver new modules to the International Space Station to expand its commercial capabilities. And this is going to start with a single module that's going to uh, berth to the very front of the station, where PMA2 is the docking adapter currently. They're going to take that off and dock a new module on there. And this module looks like it's actually going to bring its own docking adapter, which will probably allow NASA to move that existing docking adapter to a new location. And that will mean that they'll hopefully have three parking slots and a little more availability. Long term, Axiom might as add as many as three modules to the space station with a focus on providing accommodation for tourists and with an eye to potentially converting this to a free flying station in the future. But for now, that is a pretty busy schedule. To compare, between 2001 and 2009, there were eight private astronaut flights over eight years. Seven people in total because one of them wanted to go twice. Now, in the next 12 months, we're going to have more tourists than that whole uh, eight years. And that's pretty darn cool. I mean, sure, it is way out of my price range. I mean, even the suborbital stuff would probably need me to, like, work with the bank and remortgage my house. I, frankly, I have a family to raise and <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But you know, maybe by the time I'm done with that, the prices will have dropped to a more manageable level and I might actually get to fly on one of these things. 
So here's hoping for a great future of tourism and accessibility to space. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Shh.